Shroud's of the Shroud's history. He is author of the book, The Shroud of Turin, Opposing Viewpoints, and numerous articles on the Shroud, including the Shroud entry in the World Book Encyclopedia. His email address that's listed in the program has been changed since the program was printed. Uh, it is D his new one is dcscarone at att.net, right? Well, thank you, yeah, I was going to open this. Dr. Scavone. Thank you. Oh, yeah. How's that? Is that getting through? Appreciate it. My topic, uh, you can see it up there. The Shroud had, went, had been in Edessa, northern Mesopotamia, just southern Turkey, for 900 years. Stop rocking back and forth here, not coming. Oh, beg your pardon. I'll try to. <laughs> now, anyway, for almost 900 years. Uh, we can't really prove it. But we have two documents in which uh, the burial wrapping of Jesus uh, is uh, highlighted by the Edessenes. Anyhow, about 900 um, Muslims and Turks and other, and uh, Patsanax and other kinds of people were bearing down on the Byzantine Empire, including Edessa. And uh, they, the Edessenes, thought it wise to send uh, what they had uh, to, we're hoping it was the shroud, I hope to prove that, uh, and not simply a, 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 a cloth with a face of Jesus on it, but rather the entire Turin shroud. Anyway, so they uh, accepted the caretaking, you might say, of the shroud during the hard times uh, going on in Edessa. It never went back to Edessa, by the way. Are you kidding? <laughs> so numerous documents describe in important detail the presence in Constantinople of an icon of Jesus' face on a cloth, which in the year 944 had come from the city of Edessa. In Edessa, the cloth image, also known as the Mandilion, was said to be miraculously imprinted with Jesus' face and not made by human hands. My thrust here is to show that the event regard uh, the event regarding one single imaged cloth actually refers to the Turin Shroud, our Shroud, which in turn lends support to its presence over centuries in the city of Edessa. I've, I've selected several documents for close scrutiny. The documents span the period 944 to 1247. Some of the earliest documents re refer to the Mandilian alone Others assert or suggest presence in Constantinople of Christ's burial wrapping or portions thereof, along with the Mandelian. While other documents yet, yet other documents, attest the imaged burial wrappings, but not the face cloth or Mandelian. In other words, we know about as little as uh, about, we know about, <laughs> as little of the whereabouts of the shrouded early days as they did. N not more, of course, maybe. I, uh, so uh, one issue addressed in this study concerns the time of arrival in the capital, Constantinople, of the reputed burial cloth icon of Christ. Whereas a Mandelian was received in Constantinople with a great celebration, not a single source records the moment of arrival there of any larger cloth. Not a, no shroud-like image, for sure. It is, however, included in documents and at least one explicitly with a, with a Christ image on it in Constantinople. So I say we, we're going to look at several documents. In the interest of time, though, I won't go into much deal, uh, much uh, detail on the Edessa icon. We want to deal with Constantinople, but proving the shroud going back to the time of Christ in Edessa. 
Uh, I, <laughs> I won't go into much detail, particularly since over the past few days, others have um, addressed the, the issue of the Mandelian and the Edessa quite uh, satisfactorily. However, let us recall that only one clause from re Thank you. I have to Let us recall that only one clause from Edessa is recorded. The key Edessan text that supports our thesis is the 6th century Acts of Thaddeus uh, from um, uh, set during from Edessa set during Jesus's ministry. This document describes the cloth image that healed King Abgar V, that legend and uh, is, is pretty well known, I think, among Shroud, Shroud people like us. Anyway, to document the, the sixth century Acts of Thaddeus um, appeared, uh, deals with Jesus' time, his ministry. This document describes the cloth image that healed King Abgar V of Edessa who ruled 13 to 50 AD as a large sindon folded in eight, or the word, the Greek word is tetra diplon, doubled four times, doubled in eight. If you try doubling something four times, according to my mistake, you, <laughs> you, won't, get the, you won't get the shroud. Anyway, doubled in eight. Um, Okay, <clears throat> this uh, tetra diplon cloth was supposedly used by Jesus to wipe his face, leaving a faint and life-size facial portrait upon about one-eighth of the cloth. We must conclude from this that the ma a Mandelian was always the face panel of the shroud, folded in eight. This then was truly the object sent from Edessa to the capital for its protection in 944. One emphasis here is about the eyewitness reports, eyewitness reports, I should emphasize it, uh, about that singular imaged cloth from Edessa, considered to be the actual burial wrapping of Jesus. We must conclude from all of this, that the Mandelian was always the face panel of the shroud folded in eight. Say that again. It's worth it. Our emphasis here is upon the eyewitness reports. First document, the narratio or story, De Imagine Edesina, the story of the Edessa image. On August 15th, 944, amidst great celebrations, the Mandelian thought to be only the face, but really, as we will see, I hope, the shroud. The Mandelian arrived in Constantinople from Edessa. It was still stretched out against the board, a board had so uh, sealed inside its oblong case, the face visible in the circular central opening as it was subsequently seen by artists who made copies of it. The entire cycle of the Mandelian's legend and history can be found in this first document from Constantinople, the lengthy and uh, narratio of uh, the, the, about the Edessa image, written in or shortly after 944 under the auspices of rather studious future Byzantine emperor Constantine the Seventh, Porphyrogenitus. On the day of its arrival, <clears throat> Constantine the Seventh and his two brothers-in-law had a private viewing of the icon. The narratio retells in detail the Abgar legend. What interests now is Constantine's seventh personal eyewitness description of the image upon the cloth's arrival. It was extremely faint, more like a moist secretion, without pigment and without painter's art. Equally curious is a second version of the origin of the Edessa cloth, which comes later in the same narratio, in which Constantine says he prefers. I don't know where he got it, unless it was the shroud. Pay attention. <laughs> There's another story. When Christ was about to go voluntarily to death, sweat dripped from him like 
drops of blood. Then they say he took this piece of cloth, which we see now, from one of the disciples and wiped off the drops of sweat on it. This version would be inexplicable unless we suppose that traces of blood were indeed noticed on the face. Since the Edessan versions of the Abgar story exclude any idea of blood, the narratio product of an eyewitness offers this ver various, a variation along with Edessa's original version. This is it's precisely describing the face on the shroud. The next document, I'll be quick on this one. It's called the Chronographia, chronograph, of, of one Simeon Magister, as he went, uh, name he went by, uh, about 944, between 944 and 963 AD. The Narratio account is uh, nearly uh, of a nearly imperceptible image is corroborated and embellished by this Simeon, writing his book at this very time in the 10th century. He asserts that while Constantine could see the faint image in its details, his two brothers-in-law and rivals for the throne could barely make out an outline. That helps us to understand the looks of this cloth that has come from Edessa, don't you think? The next document is, uh, is longer and more important. It's a sermon of Gregory, the Archdeacon of Hagia Sophia Cathedral in Constantinople. As recently as 1986, a Roman classicist, Gino Zaniotto, turned up in the Vatican archives a 17-page Greek text of a sermon delivered by this Gregory uh, and, uh, in Constantinople on August 16, 944, the day after the Mendelians arrival. Think of it, folks, a sermon of 17 pages. That's for me. <laughs> as, as another eyewitness of the events, Gregory again recites the original Abagar legend. They were hooked on it. He describes the image as formed by the perspiration of death on Jesus' face. Then comes the most arresting part. He speaks of the wound in Jesus' side and the blood and water found there. He, he says it was formed, the, the clots were formed by the finger of God and the portrait was embellished by the blood drops from his own side. Starting to think about the shroud. The two things are full of instruction, he goes on, blood and water there and here perspiration in the image. It teaches that the perspiration which formed the image and which made the side to bleed were of the same nature, I'm quoting him, and formed the portrait. <clears throat> Is this the shroud or what? I'm supposed to smile. <laughs> Describing the Odessa cloth then, Gregory has divulged that it might have contained more than a facial image. Next document is a letter from Constantine the Seventh, <clears throat> and uh, in that year, uh, in the year 958 A.D., 14 years after the shroud had been there, but this is important in its own way. He was he sent a letter to encourage his troops campaigning around Tarsus in 958, in the, uh, in the first explicit introduction of the burial shroud icon of Jesus. It has not been said called by this idea uh, up till now. Okay. The letter announced that the emperor, emperor was sending a supply of holy water consecrated by contact with the relics of Christ's passion, which were then in the capital city, Constantinople. No mention is made of the recently acquired Mandilion and the relic of Jesus, as a relic of Jesus' ministry it would have been out of place among the relics of the Passion. Reference is made, however, to, and I quote, the precious wood, the pre a cross, I guess, the precious inscription, the titulus, and, quote, the, uh, the life-giving blood from his side, and the sacred linens, and the sindon, which God wore 
and other symbols of the Immaculate Passion. So we, no Mandelian, but shroud and burial wraps are featured in that one. This document is strong evidence that the Odessa uh, image was indeed a larger object, harmonious with the words Sindon Tetradiplon of the Acts of Thaddeus, and was seen in, uh, to be stained red in the correct places, if you know what I mean. It must thus have been unfolded and removed from its frame or, or chest in Constantinople sometime after its arrival in, seven, in 944. The great German historian von Dobschutz identified the next important document uh, appended to two codices of the narratio. Uh, he called it the liturgical tractate and attributed to it a date around 960. Its importance lies in its description of the rituals and preservation of the imaged cloth while it had been in Edessa. In that city, the image had been shown to the public only rarely. And this quote goes on, I'm quoting, during Holy Week, the image was shown to the public, which was very rare. The archbishop alone entered the room of the icon. He opened the chest in which it had been kept. And since the old chest was encased with shutters so that it would not be visible to all whenever they wished, when these shutters were, so to speak, opened up by means of many slender iron rods that were thrust through the, all the, the, the uh, then all the, oh yeah, thrust through it, then all the assembled throng gazed upon it and every person besought with prayers its incomprehensible power. But nobody was allowed to draw near to it or to touch it with hand or lips. The holy, sh uh, the holy shape, thus uh, they were not allowed to, to touch it or with their hands or lips. Thus holy dread increased their faith and made them shiver with yet more awe in their worship. I'm gonna apologize for something right now some of my stupid sounding repetitions resulted from a printing out of this text this morning at the hotel and some of the, uh, there are white clear lines down the middle of the page where the word is not visible. But I think I'm trying to get the, get the right idea across. Thank you for understanding. Anyway, <clears throat> I think, yeah. Whatever the chronology of the unfolding and uh, recognition in Constantinople, no significant new information, whether about the Mandelian or the burial shroud, appears again in the capital's documents for more than a century later. It must have been stashed, not made public. Significantly from 958 on, the burial cloth is named in every description of the imperial relic collection. The next document, number six, more than a century later, a letter which bears the date in 1095 AD falls under our purview. It purports to be an invitation sent by Byzantine Emperor Alexius I Comnenus, who ruled from 1081 to 1118, that's where we are now, uh, to, uh, to all the princes of the realm, like the Byzantine realm. Um, so I get yeah, was realm. <laughs> uh, the letter announces that the Greek Empire was under constant siege throughout by the Turks. Alexius then asserts that he prefers that, this is interesting, uh, I wonder who really wrote this. Alexius then asserts that he prefers that the capital should be captured by the Western Christian Knights rather than by the abominable Turks, more because the city houses great treasures as well as the precious relics of the Lord. These then are named, and it, all these relics are named, and include unequivoc unequivocally for the first time in these sources the linen cloth bound in the sepulcher after 
Christ's resurrection. I'm not, I'm not knocking anyone who's Turkish here because <laughs> I've been to Constantinople and I love them. I, we really do. They're sweet, most Turks. Uh, anyway, but we know what's going to happen. The Turks have been threatening Constantinople and who, who ultimately invaded Constantinople and um, you know, set up their own government there, the Western Christian Roman Catholic Knights. So uh, this was uh, at least, pardon me, at least, going, at least going to be a little bit uh, easier for them to take than the barbarian, at the time, barbarian Turks. The next document, <clears throat> oh, it's just not a document. I wanted to make a note of new art, uh, uh, art uh, styles in Constantinople. Leading scholars of, of this period, uh, Kurt Weizmann and Hans Belting, have shown that by 1100 under the empire and under, the, under em uh, Emperor Alexius, Comnenus, Byzantine iconography had involved, evolved a new style in the depiction of the events of Easter. The Threnos or lamentation scene. The developed Threnos art in Byzantium is striking for it signaled with a twin corroboration what the large burial cloth icon of Christ must have looked like. Jesus is now shown as he appears on the Turin shroud with his hands in that position and his intention, uh, in um, his entire body lying there as we see him on the shroud. In addition to this new mural art, Byzantine epitaphioi, or embroidered, embroidered cloths symbolizing Jesus' shroud in the Good Friday liturgy, they show Jesus in full length that is, in the Srenos attitude. Somehow, even before the Fourth Crusade, the Abgar story became quite popular in the West. Uh, so we have two or three uh, authors, um, I will name at least a couple of them, um, Ordericus Vitalis in 1141 and Gervais of Tilbury. They deal with the, uh, the passion uh, uh, and um, the sometime a history of Constantinople, and, but especially the Passion of Jesus, uh, as they, it was known through the Shroud in the East. The emergence of the Threnos and Epitaphios scenes in the East suggest an awareness of an imaged Shroud of Jesus already in Constantinople, which would be witnessed by Western Crusaders in Byzantine context churches. I've been leading up to this for up to now. Okay, uh, document eight. An English pilgrim um, is the next one to mention the facial, the facial, a cloth with a facial image, and uh, which is not uh, mentioned, uh, has not been mentioned in Constantinople for a long time. And he was an, an English pilgrim. He saw what he described as a gold container, a capsula aurea, in which is the mantile, which applied to the Lord's face, retained the image of his face. Next document, Nicholas, document nine. Nicholas of Soymanderson. Seven years later, 1157, this confusion of terms continues when this Nicholas Soymanderson an Icelandic pilgrim wrote in his native Icelandic his very detailed inventory of the palace relics. Riant, a good French scholar, uh, have uh, read a lot of his stuff about this period, has given us a Latin translation of Nicholas's Icelandic. He translated it as a fascie, that's a cloth, with, uh, with sudarium and blood of Christ. Unquote. Nicholas made no mention of the frame or box holding the cloth of Edessa, and indeed the reference to blood demands that we interpret these passion cloths 
uh, these as passion clause, that is to say, larger. Meanwhile, as between fasciae, bands, B-A-N-D-S, as distinguished from sudarium, both Latin translations from Icelandic, it is possible, but not certain, that one of the terms may denote a larger body cloth. Next document, number 10, William of Tyre, Count of Tyre. In 1171, Archbishop William of Tyre was admitted, he says, into the imperial treasury. He's a visitor in high rank, where he saw the sindon, quote, sindon, S-Y-N-D-O-N, of Christ. This sometime, this sometime use in these contexts to denote the Odessa cloth seem only to hint further that either the Odessa cloth was larger than a face towel or that another cloth never announced, uh, whose arrival never was announced, another cloth, large and bloodstained, was present in the treasury. We have no document that puts it there. Only one cloth. After this time, both the Odessa cloth and the burial linens regularly appear in the same inventories. Document 11, we're getting to moving along. The Prey Codex of 1192 and 1195, it seems to have arisen in Hungary. It is a, a, a picture book. Uh, the pic, the paint, pictures are uh, rather simplistic, but it's important to, that we have them because of what I'm going to tell you. It contains an Ill, at least one illustration the one I need to, to, to emphasize, which clearly manifests aspects of the shroud. It shows the four burn holes as seen on the shroud and also the herringbone weave. I need, I, I have five more minutes? So we maybe just want to touch on it? Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm uh, running behind, I'm so I'm sorry. I'll, let me skip this next one <laughs> and go to number 13, Nicholas Messarites, M-E-S-A-R-I-T-E-S. -E in 1201, the plot, the plot thickens when uh, Messarites, uh, who was the Skivophylox, or overseer of the treasures of the Pharos Chapel, which is in the, in the palace of the Byzantine emperors. So he had a big job. Anyhow, he describes two separate objects, and he would give tours. Now, we, I have several documents in his uh, name in which he says, yeah, I've got to go, it's 11 o'clock, I've got to go find some, these people are waiting in line, I've given, I have to give them the tour. Yeah. Anyway, this is what he did. And he was very intimate with the relic and the, the religious relics as well as the, the gold in the palace. Um, it's called the Bucolion Palace of the emperors of Constantinople. Again, uh, he, he, we see described two separate objects in the tour. The burial sindons of Christ, these are linen, I'm quoting, these are linen of linen, they are still fragrant with myrrh, and they have defied destruction since they wrapped the uncircumscribed naked body after the passion. In this place he rises again and the sudarium and the burial sindons can prove it. See, uh, remember that for when we come to uh, Robert of Clary, one of the crusaders. The words of this eyewitness intimate that he has seen a naked man's body image on one of these cloths. His use of the word aperileptan. You see a Greek word with an A in front of it, it negates it. It's like in the English UN, okay, aperileptan uncircumscribed, without outline, suggests that this image was lacking an outline. His reference to the passion implies the visible presence of blood on the cloth. Without too great a stretch, Meserites' words provide us an eyewitness confirmation of the hints developed from so many other documents already discussed. Nicholas, however, also specifically mentions a separate second object in his care. The towel, keromatron, keros is care, keros is Greek for hand, 
with an image of Jesus on it, made as if by some sort of drawing not wrought by hand. It's octero poetos, not kero, hand, poetos, made. So any absolute uh, confirmation of the identification made possible by the Gregory Sermon of the Edessan Manilian face only, and the Shroud of Jesus, whole body image, with presence of visible blood and water from the side would remain elusive. I have a couple more very, am I, am I time out? Le okay. I've only got 17 more pages. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, one of the Crusader Knights, Robert, Robert of Clary, I'll call him, he uh, had a, a view of the uh, place where the shroud was being kept, and we already we haven't proved that it was the shroud, uh, except by my enthusiasm. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, but uh, he said uh, we he, we saw in this one uh, palace room, it's kind of a locus classicus, attesting the presence uh, in the eastern capital of Jesus' shroud. There's another of the churches which they called My Lady of St. Mary of Blasherne where it was kept, the Sidwan in which our Lord had been wrapped, which stood up straight. Remember Mesorides? Here he stands. So obviously they had a, a pulley of some sort to, ra to raise this cloth. Uh, anyway, this is what he says. And no one, either Greek or French, ever knew what became of the Sidwan after the city was taken. I'm being asked to, um, please, tell me. Oh, the sun. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Oh, a summary. <laughs> Let's go. Glory be. Is there a God or what? <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, it's done, actually. The last two documents bear witness of the vexy question of the departure of Constantinople. The departure of Constantinople are covered in these last two. Uh, where did it go? Next thing we all know, uh, Jeffrey de Charny had it. But guess what? Um, I, okay. We know that. Jeffrey de Charny had the shroud in the West. But how he got it was through his marriage to the daughter of a man, a grand, grand, granddaughter of a man named Othon de la Roche, who documents say was given the burial wrap of, wrap of Jesus as a crusader for his. Uh, for his powerful efforts in the Fourth Crusade. Last two paragraphs? This is my wife's paper, I don't know. <laughs> she wrote it. Oh, yeah. May I? No, I'm sorry. To sum up, to sum up the points made in this paper, a linen cloth or cloths described as the burial wrappings of Jesus are attested in many Constantinople documents from 944 to 1203, that's when uh, Clary, uh, several times described as bloodied. No record exists of the arrival of Jesus burial shroud, a cloth in the capital, and no celebration such as was accompanied the Odessa Mandilian in 944, yet it was there. Judging from the copious documents, some of which we've heard of today, um, and artistic representations made in Constantinople and elsewhere from 944 to 1150, the Odessa towel always with the image of Jesus, Jesus' face may be identical with Jesus' shroud in folded form and closed in a case with the face uh, exposed. Thank you very much.